Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's version of the Virtual Plant Clinic. My name is Bill Lecter. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service in Hernando County, and I am joined today by my regular co-host, Lily Browning. We Isn't finally... This time in recent memory we've been together on here? It's been over a month, so we finally have gotten together in our special hurricane edition of the Virtual Plant Clinic, <laughs> and we're both... <laughs> Um, we're both at home. <laughs> we're both sitting in our individual homes for today. But thank God, uh, Hernando County was spared pretty much all of the storm's fury. We just had a little bit of rain. I think I just heard 0.7, not even an inch. Um, you know, a little bit of wind, nothing major here at all. Um, so you and I were like, hey, let's do the virtual plant clinic because, you know, what else are we going to do today? <laughs> so, so here I, I am went, my, in my home clothing, <laughs> ready, ready. You know, I posted on the event the other day that if we have power oh. and internet, we'll do it. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. And as it turned out, um, I guess they never can predict the track until it actually goes down the track. Yes. So, and I was just talking to Bill before we went live saying we want everyone to check in, tell us how you're doing. Um, good morning, buddy. You were you were up there nice and safe in uh, Tallahassee. The track did not decide to go to you this time. Um, good, to, good to hear from you. We want to hear a little, uh, just something from everyone, particularly our Pinellas County friends. Um, you know, any of the other places where it might have gone through a little stronger than here. Our east side of the county um, actually got, you know, a little bit, they were still within that cone of uncertainty. <laughs> we weren't over here in the west. So we are concerned with our east um, Hernando people as well. You want to hear from them? Anyone who lives along a river, your issues are unique and your issues occur what three to five days or so you know after a storm like this yeah Just anybody who lives near a river or stream or creek or body of water it takes several days after heavy rain for all the rain to move in and get deeper mm -hmm. Each flood stage, I know that we'll probably have issues with with Lacoochee River here in Hernando County. Probably within three to five days or so. Pay you've got to still be paying attention to everything our emergency management, um, Hernando County government, um, the sheriff, everything. You know, all those Facebook pages pay very much attention. If you're in a low lying river, riverine area, get out. <laughs> you know, do what you have to do to protect your property, but not that property is not as important as you are. So I see there are, there was for a second, eight people. Now there's six people um, watching, listening, please check in. Um, let us know that you're doing okay <clears throat> and who you are and you know, how things are going where you are. Yeah. Let us know where you're watching from. Lee's good. It looks That's like Lee. Oh yeah. Down there and Broward County, they got rain a couple days ago from this, yes. <laughs> and, and it's been not as bad. Mm -hmm. So uh, it could be some of our friends in Pinellas might not have power to be able to join us. So I heard this morning in Hernando County, I think there's like 3,000 people without power. But if you go down to Hillsborough, the number is much higher. Pinellas right, is much right. higher. Right. And then south of that um manatee county 85 to 95 percent of the people didn't have power and lee county is the real concern i'm hearing not good things at all about lee county so we need to really you know keep those those people in our thoughts and prayers because i don't think it's and good down there keep in mind is over just the last several years some of those counties have grown exponentially. Right. I don't normally go down that far south, but I have to for conferences and for extension work. 
And every time I go to like Lee County or any of those Southern counties, it's just like nothing but brand new subdivisions, construction, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. old depots yeah. and grocery stores and everything. It's just exploding. All the, all the newbies, <laughs> all the uninitiated. Um, <clears throat> someone, uh, one of my Northern family members was asking me, you know, what did I think would this make uh, snowbirds, you know, decide they're done with this snowbird thing. I'm like, well, for number one, they're not here right now. You <laughs> know, number two, they they know the routine. You know, they prepared before they left. If they're a long-term snowbird, it could be if maybe they're in a mobile home in a low-lying area that um, if there's damage, maybe they'll give up. You know, <laughs> with the snowbird thing. But I said we have so many people who within the past couple of years, due to COVID, due to the working from home trend, all these, you know, new full-time residents that haven't been through this before, the uninitiated, and, you know, they're the ones that uh, could be prone to mistakes or, you know, just just freaking out. But that's the way um, these storms work. You can get very, very, very prepared and then nothing much happened like here, but just because it didn't happen to you doesn't mean it didn't happen to someone. And unfortunately that that's exactly, that's the toll of living in Florida. Brenda says Keystone Heights is breezy and drizzly. That's really what it was like here in Hernando County all day long yesterday. Just, I don't, we never got any really strong gusts. I mean, it definitely made a little bit of noise and blew the palm branches around. I lost a couple of dead palm branches and some boots. I need to go out there and pick up this morning. But Brenda said, um, first responder cousin in Venice location reported 10 hours of category four winds. Wow. And first responder cousin in Orlando reported lots of flooding. We have family members in the general Sanford, Volusia County, Orange City, Deltona area. And yeah, there's a lot of flooding over there. They got an awful lot of rain very quickly. So what I think a lot of um, snowbirds and people might take a closer look at is just basically your surroundings. I know that before I we've ever bought a house, I look at, am I in the highest point in the neighborhood or at the very bottom of where the roads go down? And we had a house in Deltona. I was halfway down a little hill. And I figure, well, all the water's just going to roll through my yard, but it's not going to go into my yard. Mm-hmm. I know that waterfront and canals and lakes, they're all beautiful. But remember, they can potentially double in size, you know, every once in a while after a big storm. So keep that when, in mind. When you're looking at property, um, at least here in Hernando County, I know you can go to the Department of Public Works and um, ask the stormwater uh, department for... It has a name. I call it a squiggly line map. Um, um, you know, a flood map, a hundred year flood map. And it is incredibly accurate. It it, it um, really, I mean, almost to the foot showed me on my road, you know, where the water could go. And that's like it went right there and that's where it stopped. It didn't come to my house. This was during uh, Tropical Storm Debbie. You know, um, nothing significant happened this time. Um, but that's a really good idea to get one of those here in Hernando. You can go to the stormwater division. You can ask for John Burnett, but guess what, Bill? What? He's only got about three months left. Oh no. I know I'm, I, um, am against that idea, but anyway, (laughs) uh, he was our party now and eat, eat grocery store cake. Oh, I hope so. Um, (laughs) If you go and look in, uh, I think it's on the YouTube, at the Fertilizer Follies, (laughs) with the two worst actors in the universe, (laughs) we have a background actor making fun of a certain fertilizer product that may or may not use a Scotsman. And we had our very own Scotsman. That's who I'm referring to, who works for Stormwater. So you can see him in that, uh, in Fertilizer Follies. But you can also go to him and ask him for um, floodplain map. I think that's the official name of it. And find out, you know, do your due diligence. 
find out what you're buying by your beware. So what does Neil have that's, that's no guarantee that you're never going to have problems because I heard that over on the eastern side of the state in the St. John's River area, they're looking at potentially like a 500 year flood. So it does happen. You know, 100 year floods happen every 100 years. 500 year floods, if they haven't happened in 500 years, there might be another one coming. So mm -hmm. it can happen. How do they Here, go? I got to wait for the uh, 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 video. How do they know here. if there was a flood in 500 years? 500 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me, were there written records? <laughs> no, and you know, our records do not go back very far. 100 years, plus oh, or minus. Yeah. So things happen in cycles. Oh, more so, than that, because um, St. Augustine is older than that. We do have some records from there, but I don't think it goes back 500 years. Maybe they have geological and carbon dating and all that kind of data. St. Augustine mm -hmm. probably has some kind of written record, and they're not going to mention every thunderstorm and every tropical storm in this net. But if it was a really, really major event, I'm sure that it's written down somewhere. And St. Augustine's been there 500 years? Well, it's been there probably, you know, millions, but the town <laughs> is about 500. Yeah, the actual <laughs> settlement with yes. people there the steel day san marcos is it yeah it's it's four or five hundred years old yeah so um yes neil says that he got one of those floodplain maps it's just a good idea you know mm -hmm. and i mentioned to my wife yesterday this is one of those instances where i'm thankful for my terrible thin, overdrained Spring Hill sandy <laughs> soil. Because even during an afternoon thunderstorm, when we get a couple inches in an hour or two, the water piles up in my front yard. It turns into a lake very quickly. But after it stops raining within 10, 15 minutes, it is gone. It drains away very, very quickly. And it doesn't go into a, we don't have storm drains or a retention pond or anything. It just goes straight down. Which is how Spring Hill got away with it's um, lack of storm water infrastructure when the Deltona Corporation built it um, wouldn't wouldn't um, pass. You know, a new development would not allow what was happening there. But the only reason that they get away with it is because of the the way the sand quickly, um, you know, nothing stays too long. I was just looking at a text from a family member saying Citrus Way is not even covered in water. That is a uh, area of our county that every time it rains <laughs> is very likely to be covered in water. Uh, you know, a heavy summer afternoon rain or, you know, big downpour can, that's an um, area that likes to be covered in water. So it's not even. So, you know, we've really, really got the way I was thinking about it is if you have like a thread coming, like if I had a thread coming out of this shirt and it started to fray, you know, and the closer you get to the shirt is the hurricane. We got just one of the barely the, the frayed ends of this storm. Yeah. Lee lost a plantain tree. I've never tried growing plantains. Not many people. I mean, everybody wants to grow bananas. Not too many people think to try growing a plantain tree. I need to hunt one down and put one in the backyard, see if I can't get some plantains. I like plantains. She lost one of hers and a bunch of young plantains from the wind. And the canal water is up on her property, but not close to the house. So we're very, very thankful to hear that. And what was that YouTube link you were sharing, Dr. Lester? Oh, the YouTube link is the one to the um, fertilizer follies. Ah, okay. And you do have one also for da -da -da -da, something I did a few months ago. Are my trees storm safe? It's usually something you want to watch before <laughs> the storm, but um, it gives you a good idea of um, research that the University of Florida did. They used several hurricanes in their data as to the 
trees that um, fared well in hurricanes, those that fared medium wind resistance, and those that had low wind resistance. So, and you can also go to Hernando County Government YouTube if that link is just too much <laughs> that he has put on here. Um, are you up? Are you up to hundred classes yet? Almost, I are think ninety-one. <laughs> it's like something like ninety-one. So I'm getting there. If we didn't have all these delays, <laughs> I getting... know we had to cancel and delay a couple classes. And yes. Um, so yeah, go to Hernando County Government YouTube. Um, or you can go to Florida Friendly Landscaping's Facebook page. I put the link, you know, it's not too far down. You can find it, Are My Trees Storm Safe? And guess what I'm teaching at the, in person at the Hernando County Spring Hill Branch Library on October 12th? What? My Trees Storm Safe. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to see it in person, a little bit late, but you know, hey, it's still within hurricane season. So. Always a good topic to think about. And yeah. I've, before everything was over and I went to bed last night, I was thinking about what could I have done or what do we need to do to be even better prepared in the future? Because, you know, for the grace of God, we could have been what happened to Lee County. We could have. I mean, 10 feet of Gulf of Mexico rolling down the middle of the street, and you live closer to the Gulf than I do. Oh, come on now. Don't start this. I just had this argument with my sister. But <laughs> she lives in historic town, and she says that she lives 20 miles further from the Gulf than I do. <laughs> So she lives in Masaryk Town, and I was like, "Wow, oh, you moved to Ridge Manor without my knowledge. I think 20 miles was an exaggeration. <laughs> so then we have to hear those. 10 miles from water here, you know. I probably, probably as the crow flies from my house, and maybe four to five from where those jagged edges of the state, you know. Not, not that I could drive to, but as, as the wind blows um, from the Gulf, she might be eight. But she told me that she printed out a map that showed the jagged edges. And you have to listen to this. My house is 1.8 inches from the Gulf on her map. And hers is 2.9 <laughs> inches. So I guess she proved her point. Yeah. And when it comes to winds, that makes no difference. The winds are just as hard at, right on the beach as they are at your house and mine. But a lot of these areas, and I really hope that Hernando County always keeps all the marsh areas. You can see it kind of behind us here. Here, go ahead and turn yourself off for just a moment. Turn me off, okay. If you see that, that is what helps protect a lot of the county from storm surge. And, and I that is what I have. Um, I'm very fortunate. Um, I wish I could find a way to be able to go there and see it if I could just keep going straight west from my house. I have the Chazowitska, um Wildlife Management Area, you know, as does um, Glen Lakes and all those. That's what's right behind them. That's what's due west of me. And all that marsh area does protect you, does um, offer a lot of protection it from, acts like uh, from the storm. Fun. When storm surge comes, it helps block it, absorb it, suck it up. Mm -hmm. it, it, one of the reasons why Hurricane Katrina was such a big problem was because around New Orleans and Louisiana, they removed a lot of that. They put a lot of stuff right on the beach. And now the Gulf of Mexico can just roll right in, whereas right. 100, 200 years ago, they didn't have as much of a problem because there was, they had a lot more marshes like we do. So Right, right. And I do live east of 19, so I live approximately one mile east of 19. Yeah, not, not much. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, everybody west of 19 is always the mandatory um, evacuation zone. But yeah. I'm very thankful for the Chazowitska forest that's right there and all those marshes and everything there that you know, hopefully, obviously, with it being a um, state maintained woodland area, that's going to stay that way. So, 
I've never been to the Chazowitzka, the wildlife management area. Can you get to the, I mean, I've driven past it and around it and everything, but never really hiked it or toured it. Can you get to the water through there? No. No, I don't think so. You um, would have no. to literally stomp through a couple miles of swamp to get right. to the water, probably. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've never, you can't get to the Gulf. There is an interesting road because the roads have names in there. There's a oh. road name that fascinates me because it is called Old Bayport Road. So at one time or another, that corridor got to Bayport, got to the Gulf. But I think per a private property and um, highway, well, it's 550 on that side of 19, um, you know, stops you from being able to do it now. But you say you've never gone down to the uh, distillery down there, the speakeasy in the woods? No, you know, we still have not been down there and we need wow. to go. We do. Yeah, and now that's getting full. We, we, Nora and you and Henry and I should should meet there. It is yeah. really, and that is a, like a little private, privately owned distillery business in the middle mm -hmm. of, you know, because that property, I guess her family never deeded it to the state or whatever so you know it's it's still there it is well worth going to it'll make you feel like you're going to a speakeasy because you can only drive about five miles an hour and it's like five miles in there so no I well, love we, have a now. we can handle that yeah I love going in there um you know it's right by my house and so I'm in there all the time so I call it the jazz because you know we're close friends and uh -huh. There's two springs in there that divers love, um, Buford and, ah, what's the big one? Eagle's Nest. Oh, but, yeah, yeah, people, people yeah. drown there. Yeah, um, all kinds of wildlife, all kinds of butterflies, and it, it moves from swamp to upland pine, um, sandhill pine area, you know, sandhill ranges. It's got all kinds of cool things going on there. Yeah, Neil says he's kayak the Chaz. There's a lot of jungle and swamp in there. Yeah. When you get to the watery part, yeah. Yeah. And I got to, I had the opportunity to visit um, a couple whose house is built literally over the Chaz and they use the spring water um, for their house and everything. So if you've, if you've kayaked, you know, like under these bridges near this house and stuff, I've got to meet those people and um, spend some time with them. That was, that's like a paradise out there that they have. Yeah. Well, maybe it wouldn't have been so much like the last night or two, but. <laughs> well, it wasn't their only home. <laughs> so yeah. They had a mountain home, so in the Carolinas and I think one other. So hopefully they were at one of those. We have a question. Mithriel says many of her neighbors mowed their lawns very close to the ground just before the storm. Can you comment on the benefits and drawbacks of landscape care before and after a big storm? Cutting your grass really short is never a good idea. It's not helping with water movement or water infiltration or anything. It really has no effects one way or the other. I um, think they were trying to give themselves one less task after the storm. <laughs> yeah, it, lengthy yeah. your grass does not make a difference with water infiltration. And that's your hope number one is water infiltration. How quickly when the rain comes down, it goes into the ground and goes away. And then water movement is if your property, you're trying to make the water move from your front yard to a creek, to a retention pond, to a um, storm drain or something. Of course, you need to keep the storm drains and any paths or um, waterways that you may have in your yard clear. You know, get the branches and leaves and weeds and vines and stuff out of it so the water can go where it's supposed to go. Um, so, But other than that, that's all you can do. The length of your grass really has nothing to do with but it has everything to do with the health and safety of your lawn. Um, yeah, go to my Facebook page. Grass is health. If you go to my Facebook page, this hasn't made it to YouTube yet. Um, 
but go to my Facebook page. There's a video I did last week with your master gardener, Bernie Bathauer, called Turf Talk with Bernie. Watch that, and Bernie really gets into um, how that we need to keep our grass cut at probably four inches for St. Augustine and how crucially important that is because that the size of the shoots, you know, determine the size of the roots. And he gets into the water that gets in the soil, you know, and how far down the soil profile it gets. So if your roots are only a couple inches tall, the water is going to be down here. The roots are going to be up here. And that's when you end up having a hydroponic lawn where you're having to disobey our watering rules and <laughs> water all the time. Whereas if you had that, let the grass grow four inches, your root system is going to go down where the water is. You have a much healthier, much, 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 much healthier, more long lived lawn. So, and that is called Turf Talk with Bernie on my Facebook page. Hasn't made it to YouTube yet. I can't figure out why, Bill. I mean, it could be that our public information center has been a little bit preoccupied the last week or so. Yeah, I did a class on Tuesday because I really did not want to postpone it or cancel it because that just confuses a lot of people. And we, we still obviously have power, internet, everything else. So I went ahead and did it. I haven't even bothered sending it to him yet. I will at the beginning of next week. Yeah, John's been a little bit busy. <laughs> Between that, well, the storm came up. And um, if you watch any of the um, press releases and you see the, the back of a gentleman <laughs> setting them up and he's going testing, testing, mic check, testing. <laughs> That's the John we keep talking about who transfers our videos to the YouTube. He's a great guy. So Yes, and they've done a very impressive job with doing things on Facebook Live to keep the public informed. Mm -hmm. And lots of good posts on their Facebook page. Yes. Yeah. They, I think they did a great job. Um, the good news I had... <laughs> The good news for everybody in our county, really, is I was actually scheduled to work the Public Information Center phone line. Last night, my schedule was 4 p.m. to midnight. Um, <laughs> but I would have done it happily. Um, but I got a phone call a few hours before saying they have can they canceled that nighttime shift. And Normally, if there's not a storm, at least. At midnight, you could swing into a 7-Eleven, get a microwave burrito on your way home. But... Oh, no, no, no. At the um, informa at the emergency operations center, there's good food in there. <laughs> the fridge oh. is filled up with all sorts of donations from different um, restaurants and places. So that if you got to spend the night there or spend significant time there, which many of our employees have, what I was what I'm trained to do in the event of an emergency is sit in a small room with a bank of telephones and information being, you know, fed to us so that we can answer questions. But then if somebody calls and says, there's a tree across this road, we then get on the database and we send it to someone who's out in the bigger room. And that's where you have all your, agency um, representatives. So I would send that to um, FDOT if it's across 19 or 41 or something, or I would send it to the county if it's across one of our county roads. And they'd look at it and say, yeah, that's ours. And then they would do whatever they have to do, you know, to tell people to take care of that. Or they would be, that's not mine. I'm sending it over to with a future power or, you know, however. So that's how that whole system works. Simplified. So you don't have to go out and cut up the trees. I don't have to do that. I just have okay. to put the information in a database, swoop it to someone in the big room. <laughs> they look at it, then they call. Up until a year ago would have been my husband, <laughs> but he retired to say, go take care of that tree in the road there. <laughs> so. See, that, that's basically how the system works. 
so well you guys do a great job unfortunately i assume that they weren't overly busy with issues it was either that or they just didn't you know want us um you know that, that that's the time frame that i was supposed to go was when the storm was supposed to be here but um i think it was more of um when i'm mentioning all that is happening what's going on upstairs is our regular everyday um 911 communicators it happens all the time <laughs> so um what well, uh, probably between them and our regular you know they didn't need as many people in they just needed a couple people and mm -hmm. you know fielding the phone calls sometimes a lot of it is just um people who may be afraid and you just offer a reassuring voice you know to them too so any other questions so we were talking before we went on air about something, a phenomenon that happens with trees and uh, ground saturation, which a lot of places around here may be experiencing some ground saturation. So you may have a tree that you call Bill two years from now mm -hmm. and say, my oak tree just fell down in a bright sunny day for no reason whatsoever but we could trace it back to this hurricane and how and why does that happen? What happens is for anybody watching today who um, your yard floods, <clears throat> maybe it doesn't normally flood, but because of this um, weather event, you have a lot of standing water. There, there are some varieties of trees that do just fine in standing water or occasional standing water, but a lot of them do not do well. Pine, most pine trees, oak trees, maples, and an awful lot of other shade trees and hardwood trees, if they sit in standing water for one, two, three, four days or longer, even after the water drains away and the tree is still standing, tree looks okay, it's damaged the roots. And that root damage will over time spread and spread and spread. So now one, two, or three years down the road, the root damage gets to the point where the tree begins to suffer. And usually it'll start at the very top because now the tree can't move water all the way from the ground all the way up to the very top. Maybe the whole tree will die. The tree will drop its leaves during the summer. It's because the root system has over time become sicker and weaker and it's gotten to a point where it's really affecting the entire tree. And usually the tree is gonna have to be removed. So flooding events can kill trees sometimes quickly but a lot of times it'll take up to three years for it to really show its effects. Yep. And if you live in a spot where you have, got, I know that we've all gotten fairly regular rains the last month or so, not at, well for a couple of weeks, it was every day and it was great. I didn't have to water my garden at all. Everything growing in my yard actually looked really good and was growing very well, mm -hmm. all rain. Yeah. but really, really wet soil. For large trees with a big root system, it doesn't hold the tree in the ground very well. So really wet soil makes it easier for a great big tree to kind of fall over and have the roots pop up. So when you see on TV about the huge oak tree somewhere in Hillsborough County and the whole thing came down and half of the roots are sticking up in the air, that's what happened. The soil was overly saturated and the tree just fell over and the roots popped up in the air. Or it could have been a urban tree in too small of an area and never really rooted well to begin with. You see mm -hmm. a lot of street trees come down for those reasons. And they take the whole, some pictures show the, you know, a street tree where all the roots come up and it takes the whole ribbon of that hill strip of <laughs> um, turf with it. Like the turf never it's really did. everything. It all comes up. Yes. <laughs> um, so it, what if we do have any listeners who may have their turf and their yard underwater for a significant period of time? What happens with the turf? Obviously nothing. You, I mean, you can't go out there with a bucket and make the water go away quickly. The water's going to have to drain naturally. But the longer that your lawn sits underwater, the worse it is for the grass. 
Best thing to do, and this applies to a lawn, to a hibiscus, to an oak tree or a pine tree or whatever, after the flooding and after the water drains and everything goes back fine, don't do anything drastic right away. You need to be patient and see how well the plant responds. Unfortunately, um, if your lawn sits underwater for too long, the whole thing's going to die. If it's St. Augustine, it's not going to come back. Bahia and, if it's our, so and weeds are going to come back. I'm going to have something growing out there. Sure. It may not be Bahia grass. It may be who knows what, but I'm going to have green stuff growing out there. And if there's saltwater intrusion, then that really is <laughs> not great. Bahia, I believe, is not saltwater tolerant. <laughs> St. Augustine no, is not. Yeah. tolerant, but can't sit under salt water for like a couple weeks no i you're reminding me um several years ago we visited new orleans for the first time and um it was i don't know 10 years 12 years past katrina but what was interesting to me um it took me a little bit to figure out when we were in residential neighborhoods, of course, the main arteries are all fixed, but in residential roads and stuff, I'm driving thinking, why are we? <laughs> and then I realized the roads were still buckled. Just the resident, you know, where the houses are, the streets were like <laughs> this still. But I saw a really interesting phenomenon. Um, a lot of the street trees, you know, the old oak trees, they were still standing. But what I saw something happen that I never saw before. I have a picture of it somewhere. An oak tree, probably in response to being submerged for a significant amount of time, had created um, stumps down, all down the, you know, that narrow strip where they put the trees on a yeah. side, just like a cypress tree. But it did that in a response to, I guess, to try and get oxygen. You know, yeah, it, because that's why cypress trees make knees. Yeah. To, it's kind of a breathing tube, you could think mm -hmm. of it that way. And that, that oak tree did that as a stress response. I found that really fascinating. I didn't know they would do that. Yeah, I didn't know they would do that either. And I'm sure it doesn't happen very often, pretty rare. Yeah. But Right, yeah. I'll have to find that picture to show you. Australian pines will fall down if you breathe on them. <laughs> yes. Yes. Neil points out Australian pines. And we do have them here in Hernando County. The only place Arapica. I've ever seen them is over on the coast, though. Arapica loves them. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have a very, 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 very shallow root system. Australian pines are an invasive exotic. Um, they crowd out um mangroves and other native you know things that should be there their root system is very very shallow it's a huge tree with a shallow root system which is why then when the storms come they get knocked over but it's shallow and very far reaching so it's going to bring up everything around it and it gets in the way of sea turtle and crocodile nests you know, so they're just not a good idea. They're beautiful. Oh, they are beautiful. Yeah, they and they're very yeah. messy, too. They're very twiggy. They drop tons and tons of their needles. I wouldn't think that too many people would have it as a landscape plant. I've and, I mean, it, it was probably, if they do, it was put there before they got the house. They um, yep. love to put them um, along the coast and stuff, I think in the thirties and stuff for supposed erosion control. Yeah. Yeah. And over on the coast for maybe wind, a wind break, but really high winds are just going to blow them all over. Like Neil says, like Lincoln logs. <laughs> yes. I remember um, we just did a class recently on um, pretty darn invasive. That was the name of it. And that was one of the ones we covered. And I showed you that picture and asked you to find your master gardener yeah. in, in the thicket of the um, uh, Australian pines. I was maybe 10 feet away from her when I took that picture. And you can't see her in that thicket. 
Yeah. Uh, and nothing else will grow there then either. So, we have any other questions? Any lawn and garden questions? Any storm questions? Not that I'm the expert necessarily on that. <laughs> uh, what's it? Sid? Uh, yes. Yes, they Sid do. points out that Australian pines have a allelopathic effect on anything trying to grow near it. And what that is, is when a plant gives off a chemical either through its leaves that it drops or maybe through its roots, that basically stops other plants from growing near it. So they're, they're very uh, jealous of their space and they don't want any other plants taking their space. And they have ways of actually assuring that. Mm -hmm. It's like an herbicide for anything that isn't an Australian pine. Yeah, it is it's like hand. a natural herbicide that stops other plants from sprouting and growing around it. On the other hand, our native cedar trees will do the same thing. It's just built within the tree. So it's, you know, if you're trying to have a cedar tree and grass <laughs> near it, you're probably not going to be very successful. Yeah, I know the textbook example is... Um, black walnuts i think which don't grow in florida that i know of they grow up north mm -hmm. but you'll never see anything else growing under the canopy of a black walnut because the leaves have a chemical in them that stop other plants from sprouting and growing and competing with that black walnut so they're so, kind of smart, yeah, smart trees. Yeah. nature knows what it's doing mm -hmm. um so as a member of the water conservation department at hernando county utilities we got 0.7 according um, to the news, <laughs> you know, of rainfall just in this in the past day or so. We got a whole lot before that, as Bill pointed out. So I would like to ask you to turn off <laughs> your irrigation system until your lawn needs it again. And that is also for the health of your lawn, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is possible to water a lawn too much. And especially St. Augustine lawns, if they get way, way too much rain for too long and then you water on top of it and they get too much water, they'll develop root rot problems and your lawns will start to have dead spots. Mm -hmm. So St. Augustine needs water, but not too much water. So guys, we're not growing rice here. We're just mm -hmm. trying to grow turf grass. You don't need 10 inches of water a week to grow turf grass. Neil wants to know about pine needles that have blown into his garden beds. Will that have a negative effect? No. If pine you're needles, ornamental, pine not at all. About the pine needles in a in a ornamental bed is really good. I know people <laughs> will rake them up and use them. You can <clears> use it <throat> as mulch. Yeah, yeah. You know, nature gave uh -huh. you free mulch. Even in a vegetable garden, pine needles will make the soil acidic if you have lots of pine trees over the period of a hundred or a couple hundred years. So it takes a long time for them to actually have an effect and lower the soil pH where it becomes any kind of issue. So if we go out into the forest, into a pine sand hill area and start taking soil samples, it's gonna be acidic soil because pine trees have been growing there for who knows how many thousands of years. But mm -hmm. if you just mulch in your garden beds, it's not going to have a bad effect, but it makes for a very good organic amendment. People pay big bucks for um, pine needle mulch, especially like mm -hmm. in the Atlanta area. So um, you just were given a gift there. And here we have the uh, uh, textbook definition <laughs> for allelopathy. <laughs> I knew I knew she was going to correct herself. I overlooked it, but I know Sid, and I knew she would correct herself. <laughs> <clears throat> and Sid got just shy of an inch of rain. And that's yeah, into melon, that and um, it's a really a good thing that it bypassed uh, Citrus County the way it did because um, Crystal River doesn't hold water well. <laughs> no, um, and all the businesses and restaurants and marinas up there flood very easily yes good see neil had 2.5 lee uses pine needles as mulch in her veggie garden mm -hmm. 
um, it, they're used frequently and you can buy pine needles. You'll buy like a kind of a square bundle of them. It looks like yeah. a little bale well, of hay. Kind it of. does. It does. Yes. Yeah. We, we know someone, um, he's the director of the Osceola County extension office whose family owns, um, uh, pine plantations in Georgia. You know, his mother runs, she makes way more money on the pine straw than she even does on the trees themselves because yeah, you can collect that, that is straw an agricultural enterprise several times a year and you know and it's just something that is going to happen because she has the trees you know so it's it's like a bonus and um then they have brokers you know that sell them and i'm telling you the rich people in atlanta pay big bucks to want to have that pine straw mulch in their yards, which is funny because I have plenty of it around. And when I rake it up and put it in my beds, my husband wrinkles his nose up because being a native Floridian to him, now well, that's what poor people do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, everything comes around. Mm -hmm. So, so guys, please don't think the pine needles are poor people's mulch anymore. Mm -hmm. They become very, uh, they're uh, trendy, trendy. Exactly. So join the trend and save those pine needles, save those oak leaves, maple leaves, everything else, and either use it directly as compost or mulch or compost it in your compost pile. Yeah. Sid is, um, cognizant. Yep. Poor people are resilient. You know, the first time I ever heard about Florida friendly landscaping, um, I was an administrative assistant at County Extension, but I was reading about it and I was like, this is what poor lazy people have done <laughs> <laughs> forever. <laughs> 18 bucks for three cubic feet. So, yeah. and poor resilient people as well. But I mean, as far as not going out of your way to um low maintenance that's that's the word i'm looking for that's yeah, what yeah. florida friendly is and letting nature do what nature does you know not putting all those chemical inputs i was very happy not to do not to do that so, so these aren't like your grandparents pine needles these are new special pine needles no they're not they're the same pine needles. <laughs> sid makes a very good point she likes raking up her own pine straw, but she's fearful of invasive she might get in it like Japanese climbing fern. Well, by buying it. By buying it. So she carefully picks, you know, hers out if she has any um, on her property. So if you buy it from somewhere else, you're right. You could be bringing something in that was never there before. Yeah, that could happen a lot of ways. I am still... I guess at this point, solely in charge of the air potato patrol. <clears throat> and I put the occasional uh, videos and pictures up on our Facebook page. If anybody's interested, go to Facebook and look up air potato patrol and follow the page. And I have a couple of air potato vines in my yard that I got from a couple buckets of contaminated compost that I got from a small local farm that made it that is no longer really in business. But I have just a few and they're stuck back behind the air conditioning unit. And I intentionally let them go just to observe and see what's happening. They finally got beetles on them this year and they are just shredded. They're like confetti oh, good. Uh, and lots and lots of beetles on them right now, unless they all blew away. But when this yeah. particular storm, when it, when the human trauma is um, taken care of and addressed, we are going to see uh, studies coming out in the coming years of what new invasives got blown around as far as plant invasives and insect invasives and reptile invasives. That's what happens. Diseases years ago with citrus canker, they were trying to control Asian it. Side, yes, it yeah. And hurricanes just blew it right up the state and yeah. they gave up. Because yep. citrus yeah. canker is spread by mostly by blowing raindrops. And you have a lot <laughs> of hurricanes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's something that you're gonna look for. And 
This is September 29th. Yes. September 28th, September 29th is when Hurricane Ian has blown through our state. Does that mean we're done for the year? Technically, no. No. Remember 04? Oh, did you live in Volusia in 04? So you got all, all of those storms right at you. Yeah. Francis, yeah. Jeannie, Opal, and Pearl. That we had this the hurricane of the month <laughs> that year. So that's right. You you probably had a a lot of experience with Charlie going through there, huh? Oh yeah, Charlie went pretty much right over the house. I caught the eye wall. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of trees around the house and in the neighborhood blew a ton of trees down. Because we hadn't had a hurricane to actually try the trees for many, many years. Yep. And just because, you know, we didn't get it this time, there is no real Indian blessing or whatever they're saying about um, Tampa Bay. It's just, just hasn't happened yet. So yeah, always be prepared. Next and time I'm hoping happen what happened to, you, in Lee. Happen to me. Right. And I'm hoping what happened in Lee County, if you are in an unsafe area, you're in a low-lying coastal area if you are in a a mobile home if you're it's lots of people are living in rvs these days just go to somewhere else <laughs> you know you can replace any of that you can't replace you if you live in a houseboat don't spend the night in a marina right where the storm is going to make landfall yeah word to the wise <laughs> even though the 90 year old guy who did that Seems to be fine. But he maybe, is my hero. I'm, maybe, I'm so incredibly impressed. <laughs> no, that must have been a wild ride. I tell you what, if you if you had devices to be able to record your entire night, you would be a TikTok sensation. <laughs> but you may also be dead this morning. So, uh, you know, yeah, pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. And I understand. Um, yeah, that the, there are fatalities and a large number of them in the Lee County, at least. So leave when they tell you to leave. And probably a lot of them um, had to do with um, the storm surge. And, you know, the, these people drown. That's not a, that's not a fun way to go. Yeah. And especially leave when they tell you to leave. Coast or near a body of water. Yeah. That, or in a um, not really stable structure. Mm -hmm. I saw um, um, downtown Fort Myers, one of the news people was standing in front of a lawyer's office that had floating docks all around it, um, several boats. Yeah, yeah, you always see the boats that end up yeah. you know, five blocks in mm -hmm. land. And you can see the debris mark was pretty high up on one of, one of the standing light poles, a bunch of light poles were down. So, and the reporter said, because she was standing there, um, the water was down to like just a couple of feet. But she said when they came in the day before and went over the overpass where she was standing right there, she thought that was a river. She didn't realize that was part of downtown that she was looking at. So. And Neil points out that we didn't hear too much about those giant snails. They could have, well, this giant African land snails, they have an issue in Pasco County and Pasco did not get hit too hard, but obviously a lot of flooding, moving water is a very good way to move everything from point A to point B. That could be seeds and plants and potentially snails, snail mm -hmm. eggs. Yeah, I doubt. Unfortunately, these hurricanes never work to eradicate <laughs> these invasive no, issues. Just they just work to spread them. So. Okay, wow, it looks like it's about that time. Yeah, and if you haven't, um, if you're watching this later and you didn't have electricity, you know, near this time, I mean, I don't see Cindy on here from Pinellas County or several of the others, 
email uh, Dr. Lester and I and let us know, you know, that you're doing okay. So. And one last thing here. Let me go ahead and copy it and paste it. And let me type in, please take our brief survey. Survey. <sighs> Let's see if I spelled all the words correctly. I think I did. So let me go ahead and put that in the comments here. And for anybody watching us live, if you can just go ahead and click on that link, it's just a very, very short survey. I know a few weeks ago, a number of people who watch us on a regular basis took it and they all commented on how brief it is and how easy it was to answer the questions. We're not asking difficult questions. I'm not sending one of the 14 page surveys like the state Florida friendly landscape office does. Sometimes I just send, you know, maybe four questions to get an idea of um, how we're doing. Did you, do you learn anything from these virtual plant clinics? Is this uh, going to be like, in your is yard? Be, it says it take as long as it does to rate the um, server on the thing when you're paying for your food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Neil has a community garden. Um, Hopefully it fared okay in the storm. Yeah. I think most vegetable gardens would have. Okay, Alice, we have like three minutes left and you bring us this information. What the? <laughs> Please do expand. Alice can that. tune back in next week because next week we should have several guests on here. They were going to be here today, but they mm. were interrupted because of the storm. But because Lily and I are so dedicated, we still went on air live. To bring this to you okay um i want more information from alice <laughs> did you get it id <laughs> what <laughs> what is this information uh, i don't know maybe it's a new alice insect is it new to you or new to the universe yep <laughs> <laughs> okay well I'll talk to her in a minute <laughs> so, to get this information. She can't post a pic is what she's saying. If you can quickly email Bill, um, we might be able to. Go, go on your, well, obviously you're on some kind of electronic device, whether it be a computer or a phone or something. If you just go to your little friend Google and look up University of Florida DDIS, I think she already has it. Diagnostics idea. Identification Service is free to sign up. You can sign up for it. And if you ever have a picture of an insect or a plant or a lizard or a bird or whatever it might be, a snail, you can submit it. And that way, University of Florida um, subject experts look at it and identify it. Okay. I think she said she got it ID. Maybe it was just through iNaturalist or something. She was probably sneaking around the Chaz. Oh, here's the name. Okay, Jenny says that she can't see the survey. So let me put it in the comments once again. And that is hopefully showing up on all three platforms because we do the virtual plant clinic. This is being broadcast live on our office Facebook page our private gardening Facebook group, and also on YouTube. So I'm not sure where you're watching it from. Jenny is watching it from one of the Facebooks. So hopefully you can see the survey. And here it is on the screen also, although it's a really long link on the screen. Yeah. Um, this is the bug that Alice found. <laughs> Do you know anything about that name and that family? <laughs> Guess not. Remember where you are a podcast too. You have to use your words, not just <laughs> shaking your head there. He's saying no for those who may not be able to see him. He seems stumped by the Latin name of said insect. <laughs> are you looking it up? Is that what you're doing? Oh, no. I, I just saw. 
I don't know what that is off the top of my head. Okay. Um, send me a picture, Alice. <laughs> we'll, we'll get it for next week. And also let us know where you found it. Because if you've been sneaking around the Chaz without me, I'm going to be mad. No. That's <laughs> okay. All righty. Are we almost done for the day, Dr. Lester? Yes, we are. Um, oh, Steliops is a genus of bark lice. Okay. Um, we don't have that many different species here in Florida. There's a number of species. Um, bark lice are very cool insects. They tend to be, they're also called tree cattle. So you'll tree. see them normally on the trunk of a tree. They don't hurt anything. They just eat bacteria and lichens and fungus just sitting on the outside of the tree bark. They help clean up the tree bark to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Technically, they're beneficial, I guess. <clears throat> bark lice don't hurt anything. One way to tell it's a bark lice is if you look at it under a microscope, the antenna have many, many little sections. They have like 14 or more sections. That's a lot for an insect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure that not many of you look at insect antenna on a regular basis, but if you did, then you would see that they have a lot of sections in their antenna. Cool. And Neil just to complete the survey. Yay. Thank you, Neil. So we're going to keep showing that because we always want to get feedback from everybody to, to see how we're doing. It is because, you know, Bill is, uh, he doesn't have a lot of self-esteem, so he needs to tell you that he, <laughs> he needs you to tell him he's doing well. <laughs> no, that is what, you know, that's how the world operates these days. And that's the university wants all these surveys as well. It looks like the antenna is under its eyes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Send the email the picture to Bill and to me so we can see this and let us know where you found it and all of that so and as always if you have any further questions you can email send the hard questions to lily there is her email because she has a forward button and oh, send I really questions to me while bill was out of town in savannah i had a gentleman um interested in what type of organism um, develops at the bottom of his bucket. <laughs> so this has happened, you know, in his life. First thing I did was send it to um, uh, a lady in my office who used to work at Mosquito Control, and she said, well, those would be at the top, you know, because they need to breathe if it was some kind of mosquito. So I ended up involving I'm one of the water experts at the University of Florida, Dr. Yilin Zhang. We've had, Bill has had her on before. And then she ended up involving, I, and at, at the end, while Bill was away, I communicated with four or five university experts who <laughs> really got into IDing what these things are. And now I'm trying to remember what the bottom line answer was. I believe it was a some midge. type of midge, or a midge. Blind, also called blind mosquitoes, midges. Yeah, but they're not really mosquitoes. They're more like flies, kind of. Sure, it's, it's in the fly family. Yeah, so they were midge larvae. <laughs> but well, he had said, while Bill was gone, I was communicating with all his colleagues who were getting really excited <laughs> passing this around to try and ID it. So... So even if we don't know what it is, we'll find somebody who can figure out what it is. Right, and get really excited about it, too. As I said, I hang around people and even master gardeners and all the university people. You ask them a question that they don't know. The answer will not be, I don't know. The answer will be, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, and they're just curious people who love to learn. So you give them a challenge. Okay, gosh, it looks like it's that time. So much for having a, a short day. Yeah. So, hey, everybody, we will be oh. back next Thursday. Are you going to be here next Thursday? As far as I know, but Monday. 
you and I are teaching at 10 o'clock the class we were supposed to teach yesterday. Um, part two of natural products for pest control. 10 a.m. on my Facebook page. It will be recorded. Um, and we will be covering in part two biological stuff, <laughs> you know, for pest control, like BT and spinosad and viruses and nematodes, stuff like that. And Bill's going to do most of the information. Talking. Are we going to do that on Zoom or are we just going to record that? Um, we'll go ahead and we, uh, we scheduled it for 10 o'clock on Monday at Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yep. I'll that's be there. What was that? I said, I'll be there. Yeah. Good. Because I need you to do most of that talking. That's a hard, <laughs> that's a hard class. So. <laughs> okay. Well, Hey everyone, we are going to go and we will see you back here again next Thursday morning at 10 AM. Like I said, hopefully I can get the guests who were supposed to be on today to be on next week, but that's going to depend on their schedule. I'll find somebody. We'll find somebody. Oh, yeah. And as far as I know, I'll be around next Thursday. So I'll be here also. And you be know what they say, which here. applies right now? Lord willing in the creek, don't rise. <laughs> now that really... <laughs> That really well, applies. Right we're now. near a creek, fortunately. So we don't, but on the east side of our county, they do. Yes, we Coastal do. Areas they do. So okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, and everybody, stay safe out there. Yeah. Uh, keep everybody, so all of our regular followers and listeners down there in Southwest Florida, in your thoughts and prayers. And yes, please do. And if you watch this later. Something. When you regain your um, electricity, um, be with us next week. Let us know how it went and email Bill and I in the meantime, too. So. Okay. Thanks again. See you All next right. week. Thank you, everybody. All righty. Bye-bye.